Hello, my name is Solmel Veradia. I am a medical doctor, and I am giving you a presentation about transgender ideology examined, or gender ideology examined. Now, I was trained in family medicine. I graduated residency in, I believe, 2017. I actually practiced as an adult hospitalist for many years before leaving the field of medicine to pursue other business uh, ventures. But now I'm kind of getting back just into this to take care of something that apparently nobody else in the medical field wants to touch, which is gender affirming care. So let's get into it and I'll explain to you just how absolutely insane and predatory this entire movement is and give you the truth on its origins, where it is now, and where they plan to go in the future uh, with their own words many times. And you'll see just how crazy the entire thing is. Your suspicions about its craziness will be confirmed. So I'll go through the history and its modern movement. I'll go through the definitions of what they say gender and also sex are nowadays. They've changed the definitions of sex as well. Uh, the diagnoses that they give to children, and then the treatment, the quote-unquote treatments that they give to children as well. Now, none of, the, uh, none of the information presented here are things that I discovered. They were all uncovered by dozens of online journalists, mostly bloggers and Twitter users, and then quote-unquote conservative influencers, as the mainstream media refused to report on any of this. And I say conservative because nowadays if you oppose this in any way, like gender-affirming care, which means that you are based in basic reality, you are labeled conservative. And so a lot of these people are not actually conservative. They're not far-right. They're just labeled that way because anybody who opposes this is labeled as a far-right Nazi. And so these online influencers and journalists fought the battle that doctors, quite frankly, would not. Number two, there are a few instances of inappropriate languages. It's not me. I'm just reading off of the documents that are provided by governments and hospital systems, and I'll show you these documents, and I'm going to read them, and it's the wording that they use. Number three, every slide here is real. I have not made any changes to the information presented, no matter how insane it seems. We are just simply dealing with an insane ideology, and that's why it is that crazy. Number four, what is presented here is by no means comprehensive. It is only a very shallow dive into how dark and crazy the gender ideology movement is. I'm showing you probably 5% of the stuff that I could show you. It gets even crazier, but I had to narrow it down to just give you an idea of the basic craziness of this movement without having the presentation go on forever and ever. <clears throat> so a couple of miscellaneous notes. Number one, this entire debate over gender dysphoria, dysphoria is one of the most ridiculous and outlandish debates in human history. It is literally at a fifth grade level of discourse, probably even younger than that, to be honest. And it's no more complicated than being able to figure out if two plus two equals four. So the fact that a presentation like this even needs to be done or given signifies how far our profession and society in general have fallen. We have reached a twilight zone with regards to basic logic and comprehension of reality. This is, I would say... This is simultaneously the dumbest presentation I've ever had to give, but also, in a way, the most important presentation I've had to give. And hopefully you see why by the end of it. However, society has devolved to the point that these insane arguments are being taken as intelligent and progressive. And they need to appeal to your emotion and your sympathy. And when I say they, I mean the, the proponents of this, of this movement. They need to appeal to your emotion and sympathy to continue justifying the abuse that you're committing on these kids. Because if you actually ask intelligent, reasonable questions about it, their entire narrative falls apart. So 99% of these kids that are going down these pathways of gender dysphoria, etc., they're, they're they don't have the diagnosis. They're simply falling into a social fad and then having their mental illness preyed upon, which I'll show you examples of. And then those in favor of these ideas actively want to silence your dissent and stop any and all debate and I know everyone in society has felt this. This is the topic that everybody is so afraid to even touch. And we know why. And they use tactics such as harassment, doxing, threats. And those are what the activists use. But then your own employers and hospital systems and the medical organizations will effectively threaten you with loss of employment, loss of your license. Or like, at least that's what most people in the medical field believe. None of these things are actually going to happen, but they have scared people into believing it. And I'll probably have to break this uh, entire presentation into two parts. Uh, just because it probably go a little bit too long. So we'll just finish part one for now. So just to give you an idea how crazy this movement is, let's just go through some adults who are now taking advantage of the 
new definitions of sex and gender according to the new experts. So on the left hand side in the upper part, here is a picture of a person who is now apparently named Isla Bryson, formerly Adam Graham. He was a UK rapist who just changed his gender and transitioned from male to female before appearing in court where he was found guilty of raping two women. Now you can see he looks like a typical skinhead. He has a shaved head, tattoos on his face, and then all he had to do was put a wig on to cover his tattoos, put some makeup on, and then that's about it. You can see he didn't get any surgeries because in the picture on the right, he still has a bulge in his pants. But that doesn't matter. As long as you say you're a female in today's society, you are a female, and now he's housed in a female prison. So a man who raped women is now in a place where he could rape more women. And that is considered scientifically accurate nowadays. And it's considered, considered the right thing to do because if you put him in a male prison, then it's the wrong prison. This one uh, next to it, you probably have seen this, hopefully. It's about a teacher in Canada who showed up to school with giant prosthetic breasts. This is all 100% real, by the way, if you've never seen this. And a wig saying that he was a woman named Kayla Lemieux. And the school took him seriously. They allowed him to teach. They did not allow students to voice any opposition. Anybody who was caught speaking out against this was punished. And the funny thing is, this guy was clearly trolling the school system because he was a more conservative, anti-politically correct guy, and he was being disciplined for that. So the next week, he just showed up dressed as a woman to effectively show how stupid their policies were, and he got away with it for close to a year. And, I mean, mission accomplished, obviously. Next to that is another real story. None of these things are fake. These are all real. A 50-year-old biological male competes against 13-year-old girls in a swim competition. Not only that, he was allowed to change in the same locker room as the 13-year-old girl. All you have to do in today's society is grow your hair out, and then that's it. Apparently, you're a woman. And so when investigative reporters actually confronted him about it, the reporters were labeled transphobic and told to leave the premises, even though this guy, when he was confronted, actually ran to his car because he knew that he was a child predator. And then on the right, there is Zara Jade. Obviously, you can see uh, just a very beautiful woman with a bit of a uh, five o'clock shadow, some stubble, jailed after stabbing and tying up victims. But obviously, you got to put him in the uh, women's jail because it's the scientifically, biologically accurate thing to do. If they say they are, that's what they are. Uh, and now the two stories below, these are probably my favorite ones. Uh, the one on the right is about Kylie Palm, a biological male who pretended to be pregnant, then said he had a stillbirth. He then was able to raise money to help with his grief for his stillbirth. He attended classes, birthing classes, with women. And some of these women were kicked out of the class for saying he was a man pretending to be pregnant. And you can see, uh, let me get my mouse, get the mouse works. Right here, this is what he actually looks like. Uh, they, they always doctor their pictures to make them look more feminine, but this is what he actually looks like. But anyway, if you're a woman in the birthing class, you got kicked out, not him. And then this is another great one. Uh, there was a, there's a women's and non-binary person's tech fair called the Grace Hopper Fair. And so what a, bo a bunch of foreign-born, it was mostly Indian men from India who traveled over to, I believe in San Francisco where it was, they traveled over to, the, to this conference, and they just checked that they were all non-binary on the on the application and so then apparently hundreds if not thousands of indian men were just let into the conference because they put that they, they were non-binary on their application and there's nothing you can do about it because whatever a person's gender is with what what they state they are that's what it is you're not allowed to question it now of course they were accused of lying like the organizers of the fair said that these men were lying but they can't prove it and legally they can't do anything about it because in the state of california you are legally allowed to just say you are whatever gender you say you are. That's it. Done deal. So you might be asking, how did society get to a point where people fall for something as stupid as these news clips? Well, effectively, it's coming from the colleges. And I'm going to show you many, many examples of college students who are currently in universities, you would think are educated, who cannot tell you what females are, who cannot tell you what women are, who cannot tell you what basic biological sex is. They, and they're being taught this in the school. So it's not really necessarily their fault. This is what they're being taught. So if you tell them, go to school, trust your teachers, and then your teacher is teaching you false information, you can't expect a 17-year-old child to know how to navigate that. 
And so I'm also going to show you clips of fully grown adult women who are at in a, uh, a woman's march. And then when they're asked, what is a woman, they can't answer it. They say it's a trick question. They, they, they pause. They, they stutter. They mumble. They don't even know what they're talking about. So let me play some of those. Uh, bathrooms and things like that. And the, the females. So why would that? Why would that matter then? They're, they're identified as females. They believe they're females, so they're female. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So okay. How would you define what a woman is? Hmm. How do you define what a woman is? Oh my God. <laughs> I think a woman. Is, well, that's, that's a trick question. It's a trick oh, question. Wow. A human being. Um, we're selling uterus pins, but that doesn't mean that if you have a uterus, you're a woman, or if you don't have one, you're not a woman. She said, we're selling uterus pins, but if you have a uterus, it doesn't mean you're a woman. If you don't have one, it doesn't mean you're not a woman. These are college students. Well, can be in the feminine way, but also can be in a non-binary way as well. Any innate differences between men and women today? Um, uh, I don't know how to answer that question. She does know how to answer it. She's just afraid to say that there are differences between men and women because that would be politically incorrect. <laughs> Do you think that anyone can be a woman? Anyone probably could be a physical woman if they would like to. If they want to. Yes. <laughs> I think it's a choice. All right, so that's one video. Here's more of college students not being able to, or college students who think that Trans women, quote unquote, trans women with penises are now officially females, and then a whole bunch of other young people not being able to, to tell what their sexuality is, but then forcing you to obey their rules about sexuality, even though they can't even define it. What you're saying is that a quote unquote trans woman is a female. By the definitions I'm familiar with, yes. <clears throat> so how would you define female? <laughs> Through my training. In healthcare, there are several different categories for how we define sex. People bring up pr chromosomes. People also bring up hormone levels. People bring up all sorts of other categories. Lots of people don't fit neatly into a gender binary, even people we don't consider to be intersex. It's a complicated spectrum. It, it's not complicated, but you also didn't, you also didn't define. So, so what, is, what is a woman? What is a female? What do, what do these words mean? It's complicated, and I know you're not going to like that answer, but that's because there are no simple answers. It doesn't matter. Should... So as you can see, that's an EMT. So he has some medical training. He also thinks that he's a woman now. And th he even states, this is what I was taught in my biology class. So how can you necessarily blame him for what he believes? And here's more evidence. These are more college students. These are real videos, by the way. These are people that go out there and ask college students questions, put them on YouTube, and, and they, get, and things like that. they get popular. Because society has become so crazy, people love watching the insane answers these college kids give. So this woman, or this girl right here, actually believes that if a man calls himself a woman, surgically removes his penis, and gets a surgically constructed vagina, that he now has the ability to give birth. She actually believes that. Watch. Constricted by I mean, whatever your gender is. I'm just saying, who's going to give birth, though? Well, that's just because my body works that way. Well, are you gonna, aren't you going to take care and like, I mean, feed the baby? I mean, trans, get a vagina, and then do the exact same thing. No, that's, that's, not, not, that's not how it works. You, uh, you can't well, it doesn't work. No, you can't do that. No, you, no, you can't do that. You, 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 have, you to have to be, be born. born. Really? Yeah. Really? Yes, because you you're born, born with um, um, eggs. To give birth. There's a set amount of eggs. <laughs> 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 he's so happy. He, 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 he just can't cut his dick off and then say he's a woman and make babies. How many genders are there? I don't know. So many. Like, give out a number. I don't have a number. In terms of gender, there's a spectrum. Like over there's 50. No, over 50? That's what I've heard. Huh? Well, what about you? How many genders are there? I was going to say, over 50. There's over 50. Can you name me like four? Four? Um, you can only name two? I can only name two because I'm not Which one are they? I guess. Men and women, I guess. Uh, so this is a pride parade in Texas, so not even a liberal place. And you'll see how insane these answers are. They, she. Uh, they, he, non-binary, trans, maps. And by the way, so this, this woman, who looks like she is maybe anywhere from 18 to maybe 22 years old, I don't know exactly, but fairly young, 
Uh, she says she's non-binary, trans, mass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all these words to just describe a woman. Look at she has bandages here. She's had a mastectomy. Doctors, surgeons, surgically removed her breasts because she went to them and told them, "Oh, I'm non-binary." And then these these scumbag surgeons removed her breasts. I like frogs, not people. I'm sorry. I like frogs, not people. My husband back here is bisexual. He finally came out to me about that. It's not endangering them, but he wants to become a girl later on. I'm so for it. I'll tell him what hospital do you want to go to right now. How young do you think that kids can start telling us their gender identity? Kids know like almost immediately. I mean, you guys go to school, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I'm able to formulate words. If that's how they. As soon as you can formulate words, a child is able to tell you that they're the wrong gender. Well, then. That's who they are. I started hormones, testosterone when I was 14. Over COVID, I think me and my friend group, we kind of all started exploring our gender. And I think this, I think the internet had a really big part to play in a lot of our discovery. I don't think. Uh, I will go into this in much more detail about how social media almost is exclusively the reason for this explosion in quote unquote transgenderness and queerness in the youth. Myself as a female, I think of myself as a pansexual. I am a male trapped in a female's body. Being a man mean to you? Oh, um... That they're scared they're gonna be sent to a conversion camp or that they'll be executed if they're an adult. Executed? Yeah, so in Florida, which is where a lot of my family live in, some people can actually be... I've heard that some people can actually be put to death over there. <laughs> And you see the amount of propaganda pumped into these young people where they – this girl who says she's not attracted to humans, she's attracted to frogs, but she's hated, she's waving a pride flag, then actually believes that in Florida people are put to death for apparently being trans or part of the LGBT. She thinks they're being executed in Florida, the insanity of that. So this next clip, you're wondering how are these youth so brainwashed and – this next clip is not necessarily a guy asking LGBTQ questions. He's just asking them simple, basic facts about things in America that any child should know. But it shows you how little the youth of America are aware of. They have no basic knowledge about anything. They're not being educated in the schools. And so they're able to be brainwashed after that. So if you tell them what is a female or what is a male, they have no idea because they really don't have any idea about anything. And you'll notice also... All the people in these videos coming up are all draped in either a trans pride flag or, a, or they're holding a uh, pride flag, and yet they can't even answer basic, basic geographical questions. How many stars there are on the U.S. flag? 52. Yes. What state is Utah in? Michigan. Yes. You know what state Utah is in? No. Utah, I... To be honest with you, I've never heard of that place ever in my life. Yeah. I live under a rock. Can you name three countries besides the USA? I suck at history. I was like, my worst subject. Can we do like science? <laughs> no, no, no. Any three. Any three. You know this. A country? Oh, yeah. geez. This is terrible. Notice she's wearing a bri bi pride dollar? shirt. <laughs> she's holding a pride flag as well. A dive is the 10 set or the 5 set? You tell me. <laughs> No. Can you name three countries besides the USA? Um. Yeah. Any three. You know this. Canada? New Mexico? Right? I identify. So, in case the audio is not that great, these are teenagers who look like they're at least college age, who think that there are 52 states in America, who cannot name three countries outside of the US. They think New Mexico is a country. They don't know what Utah is. Uh, they don't know what a dime or a nickel is and how many dimes go into a dollar. And yet they're all so certain about their transgenderness and the 52 genders. A lot of these people literally, and then there are other videos, but they cannot add 80 plus 20. Yet somehow they know that there are, are like 100 genders. So this girl, you'll see her talk crazy talk. She's even a little, a little bit older, but she'll talk about pansexualness like that other girl did. But then when you ask her what pansexual is, she has no idea. As bisexual, pansexual. What is pansexual really quick? Because I'm not sure. Um, 
because I might not be the best authority to speak on that. When I see an American flag, I uh, I immediately look at that per like I'm like that person's probably a bigot. That person's probably a homophobe. That person's probably a racist. If they're just flying American flags out everywhere. So you what you're saying? So if you have an American flag, you're a racist and a homophobe and a bigot. You also notice her pink hair. That is a very common theme. Look at the blue hair hair here. Coloring their hair is part of the social justice cause. As you can see from this girl at the end, where she talks about pansexualness one second and then how people with American flags are racist, this is really just a political movement. These people color their hair to signal their alignment with a political movement, with a political ideology, and transgenderness is just a part of that. So you might be thinking, oh, doctors can't what fall for this stuff. Doctors can't fall for this stuff. Well, here is a doctor in front of politicians saying men can get pregnant. Mark, can biological men become pregnant and give birth? Um, so men can have pregnancies, especially trans men. And then here's the last clip that demonstrates how a five-year-old child from the 1980s is without exaggeration more intelligent about basic biology and human biology than fully grown adults and even doctors in the year 2024 from the classic kindergarten cop. Boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. If you say that nowadays, you will be labeled a transphobe and a homophobe and a bigot and a racist. So... Speaking of the 50 genders that that one girl talked about, what I'm showing you here is an actual government document that I downloaded only a couple days ago off of a website associated with the city of San Francisco, and, and they list that they are affiliated with officially, because there's the Office of Transgender Initiatives here, sf.gov. It's also associated with the Office of the Mayor. I didn't include that emblem, but they, it was on the website as well. And this is an application for guaranteed income for transgender people. Where the city of San Francisco was, and apparently still is, since you can still download the application, they were giving $1,800 stipends to homeless people who also happened to be trans because they believe that the trans people are so oppressed and marginalized that they need extra income. Right? And so all of these screenshots are screenshots I took myself from the PDF file that you can still download today. So on the left are all of the gender choices that you can actually choose, right? So they say there's 50 genders, 100 genders, infinite genders, and a, if a child tells you these genders, you're apparently supposed to take their word for it, believe them, affirm them in their gender, and not question it at all, even if they get started on medications. So let's take a look at some of these genders. The first one is man of trans experience. Sounds strange. Here's one that maybe sounds a little bit more familiar, female to male, although they say gender is a social construct, a construct, and yet here they're using biological sex terms, so they're already confusing things, which just shows you how they can't even keep their own ideology straight, but whatever, it makes a little bit of sense. Then there's demi-boy gender, t-boy, trans guy, brother boy. These are all apparently official genders released by experts, and remember, if you don't trust the experts, you're being anti-science. Then there's genderqueer, xenogender, there's aggressive, ag gender. So if a little boy comes up to you and tells you, I'm not a boy, I'm actually aggressive gender, you have to affirm it. Then there's a good, there's the, here's the best one, gender outlaw. Th this is real, I'm not making this up. Then here is a little bit of profanity, it's, it's on the application, gender fuck. I'm not making it up. Then there's omnigender. I don't know, maybe that's like an omnipotent god or something. Then there's another area for you to select your sexual orientation. And you can check all that apply. So there's aromantic, asexual. I would have thought those are the same thing, but apparently not. Then there's BDSM kink sexual. So I guess you can, you can be kink sexual, not just heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, kink sexual. Then there's demisexual. Then there's dyke. Apparently dyke is a sexuality now. And then, again, I'm not making this up. This is on the application. Faggot. Apparently, the city of San Francisco, with all their expertise, can allow you to choose faggot as your sexuality. And an even better one than that is apparently there's scoliosexual. 
Then there's T4T sexual, which is trans for transsexual. Whatever that means, you can't question it. So it, already you're seeing the absolute insanity and how nonsensical this entire movement is. Now, in case you thought that these crazy genders and sexualities that are clearly made up are not being used in actual medical clinical scenarios, you would be wrong. So this therapist, just recently in February of 2024, exposed what was going on in the Mary Bridge Children's Hospital gender clinic. So she openly talked about how she's a licensed therapist, and she was called to affirm the gender of abused, autistic, suicidal 13-year-olds and to ignore their other mental health problems and ignore all of her training to just simply say it was all due to gender dysphoria and to medically and surgically put, push them along the pipeline to get these uh, drugs and surgeries. So she writes, I was getting the message from my supervisors that when a, su a young person I was seeing expressed discomfort with their gender, the diagnostic term is gender dysphoria, I should throw out all my training. No matter the patient's history or any other mental health conditions that could be complicating the situation, I was simply to affirm that the patient was transgender and even approve the start of a medical transition. So she was afraid to say anything. Oops, sorry. She was afraid to say anything, but she knew she had to. Otherwise, these youth were going to be medicalized and be an irreversible harm would be done to them. So she talks about one specific 16-year-old girl that she had as a client who started saying she didn't feel like a girl anymore during the pandemic, which is another issue we'll come back to where the pandemic made kids so lonely and isolated and exposed them to so much social media that it exploded the number of kids coming out with quote-unquote gender dysphoria. So this girl, she says, quote, also had a pl plethora of mental health issues. The girls started using they slash he pronouns and identified as pansexual. We'll also see that more coming soon in my presentation. And using a gender-neutral name. Her father refused to let her take testosterone, so she didn't. All that Mary Bridge Children's Gender Health Clinic could do in the meantime was give her birth control to stop her period due to her menstrual dysphoria. In early 2023, the girl had decided she was no longer gender-neutral, but instead she identified as a, quote, wounded male dog, quote, she was also xenogender, a concept that goes, quote, beyond the human understanding of gender. She wanted to start wearing ears and a tail. The therapist, Ms. Pritzke, or Pitske, asked her colleagues if there was ever a time when being so freely affirming was not necessary, and the answer was no. One colleague said, it sounds like this isn't, this isn't something that's broken, so let's not try to fix it. If someone told me, they use a litter box instead of a toilet, and they were happy with it, and it's part of their life that brings them fulfillment, then great. So already you see, they are literally using these fantastical, nonsensical genders like xenogender and omnigender and gender outlaw to affirm kids and then send them down the pipeline of getting drugs and surgeries, even if they say completely ludicrous things like they identified as a wounded male dog and they used litter boxes at home instead of toilets. That's just one child. She also talks about how uh, there was one 13-year-old autistic child who was unable to communicate properly with her and started showing Pitsuke extremely sadistic and graphic pornographic videos on her phone during the first visit. She said the troubled girl was hyper fixated on the porn videos and said they were the only genre available to her when she was growing up with her abusive mother. The girl, who despite being a teen, would suck on pacifiers and watch Teletubbies, recalled how her mom nearly killed her sister. She had also just been expelled from school for threatening to blow up the building. So, clearly, clearly these kids have other major mental health disorders, but that doesn't stop them from, number one, even being referred to a gender clinic in the first place. Why are these people being referred to a gender clinic when they clearly have, or clearly have other major health problems or mental health issues? Because they prey on young kids. These clinics are not altruistic. They're not good people. They prey on young kids like a cult. And so this therapist, even though these other kids had physical and mental abuse, raging anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, she was reprimanded by her superiors for not immediately signing off on children's requests for puberty blockers and sex change surgeries. Not doctor's requests, but children's requests for puberty blockers 
and sex change sur surgeries. And then despite this, she was shunned into, into quickly signing papers to give them life-changing medication, and when she brought up her concerns, she was accused of being prejudiced against trans kids. These people are psychotic. We will see a lot of the themes that I've discussed here about autistic kids, uh, abused kids, foster kids, pornography. We'll see that throughout the entire gender ideology movement. Now here is another whistleblower, Jamie Reed. Uh, she exposed what was going on in the Washington, uh, I think, Washington University Medical Clinic, uh, which had a gender clinic. And this is not a conservative woman. This is a, she identifies as a queer woman, politically to the left of Bernie Sanders, who has been liberal her whole life. And even she knew that they were abusing children in foster care, sexual minorities, and the poor. She says, I left the clinic in November of last year because I could no longer participate in what was happening there. By the time I departed, I was certain that the way the American medical system is treating these patients is the opposite of the, prom the promise we make to do no harm. Instead, we are permanently harming the vulnerable patients in our care. Today, I'm speaking out. I'm doing so knowing how toxic the public conversation is around this highly contentious issue and the ways that my testimony might be misused. I am doing so knowing that I am putting myself at serious personal and professional risk. So, thankfully, some people are speaking out. They're not doctors, because, quite frankly, doctors don't have the courage to do this. But at least there's some healthcare professionals doing it. And it just shows you that the dam is starting to break a little bit in terms of people speaking out. This guy, Billboard Chris, who I talk about a lot, he stands outside of places and, and cities and stuff like that with a billboard on himself saying, children cannot consent to puberty blockers. He gets 90% of people agreeing with him. So you are the majority. These lunatics in the minority are not, they don't speak for everyone. They don't even speak for more than 20% of people. Everyone knows they are crazy. Everyone's simply too afraid to say anything. But even in front of the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics conference in Anaheim in 2022, pediatricians were overwhelmingly saying they agree with him. They would walk past him, read the sign, and say they agree. Now, people need to start speaking out, especially in the medical community, because otherwise, psychotic politicians who are using what's going on in the medical community will introduce bills like this. So this non-binary Colorado State Rep Stephanie Vigil says she does not believe in the nuclear family, a.k.a. families with kids having two parents in the home, and thinks parents shouldn't have full say over their kids. She introduced a bill which would allow kids to change their names at school without parental knowledge and would punish teachers who don't go along with it. This is only the tip of the iceberg. They're already removing kids from families who don't, uh, if the parents don't agree with chemical and surgical transition, as I'll show you later. But just to give you a little bit of hope that maybe the world, including medical doctors, are actually waking up and starting to actually speak out, this is a series of screenshots that I took myself from a physician's Facebook group that has about 70,000 physicians. Now, I blurred out every single name and every single profile picture here uh, to keep everyone anonymous, except for my name. Uh, I kept my name over here. I think uh, I might have made another comment right here, but yeah. I was banned from the group because I obviously spoke out against gender ideology. I called it insane, uh, child abusing movement. And the reason this post was has all these comments is because one doctor posted a picture of her seventh grade child's biology quiz so the kid is learning biology probably in junior high and the question says the uterus is associated with which system so he obviously picked the female reproductive system that was a wrong answer in today's world the answer is reproductive system meaning both male and female reproductive systems and so that caused a massive uproar in the forum or in the community and I was very surprised because mostly people are not allowed to speak out about this, even in this Facebook group. But I think people have just had enough. And so, to my surprise, the majority of responses and comments from doctors were against gender ideology and people calling it madness. They were making jokes about how you're not allowed to assign gender without being punished with jail time and possibly death on social media. And lots of people were laughing at it and agreeing with it. And people were saying openly, if they say hey, if someone has a uterus, they are female. This person said, Jesus, I'm glad my kids are grown and flown, meaning she's glad or they're glad their kids don't have to learn this nonsense. This person said, makes my blood boil. Can't believe this shit whole society we live in now. His answer was 100% correct. I said it was insane. I had people agreeing with me saying 100% correct. 
Uh, this person says, you can't be serious. This has to be a troll. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I feel like I'm losing my mind. This person says, wow, the brainwashing agenda for children continues. And lots of people agreed. People said, this is insanity. People agree. People say, I-R-R-I-P, I biology. People agreed. Uh, this person called everyone who was against gender ideology bigots. So these are doctors calling other doctors bigots, to which people started laughing. One doctor replied bigots and said, LOL, dude, you are the problem. So now this is going to cause conflict within the medical field. And if you think it's going to be avoidable, you're kidding yourself because this is going to draw a very clear line down the center of the medical field. And there's going to be people on one side who believe in basic reality and basic medical ethics. And on the other side, they're going to be going to be people who don't. You're going to have to choose which side you want to stand on, but the majority stand on the side of reality. And here's more examples. Study finds indoctrination is more successful when started young. We all know that this gender ideology, ideology movement is indoctrination. People making jokes, calling it a woke uterus. Glad I don't have kids. Pathetic. Can't change biology. The world is going crazy. This is ridiculous. So on and so on. Remember, these are all medical doctors. Now, let's get into the actual history of the gender movement and it's very dark history so one name you'll probably hear a lot is john money who was apparently a phd researcher he is at the very least one of the pioneers of the gender movement some say he actually started it so it is believed he first started using the term gender as opposed to sex in the 1950s and this was meant to differentiate our biological sex from the behavioral characteristics that may be attributed to social conditioning such as men you know going out to work having their hair cut short maybe shaving their head, uh, wearing men's clothing, stuff like that, whereas women wear dresses, lipstick, and are, you know, used to be stay-at-home mothers and stuff like that. Those are attributed to social conditioning. Now, Money also used a pair of young boys, the Reamer twins, or a Reimer, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it, but as effective test subjects in his experiment on gender. And he was able to do this because David, who was originally born Bruce, but changed his name to David later on in life, was a young boy who underwent a botched circumcision for a treatment of his phimosis that led to significant disfigurement. And as a result, money convinced his parents to allow Brian, or sorry, it should say, it should say Bruce, to undergo clinical castration and to just raise him as a girl. So there were two twins, uh, the Reamer twins. One of them was born as Bruce, but then he underwent this uh, botched circumcision that led to disfigurement. And so the parents eventually agreed to raise him as a girl after uh, he had an orchiectomy. So David was at, uh, originally raised as, as Brenda. And so here you see Brenda, and then later on in life, he changed his name to David. I think he was trying to forget his entire past of being born as Bruce, being changed to Brenda, so he just changed it to David. So at the age of 22 months, David underwent a bilateral, bilateral orchiectomy in which his testes were surgically removed and a rudimentary vulva was constructed by genital plastic surgery. Uh, it's already crazy enough, but it gets worse. So Money was able to have David or Bruce as the, as the experiment, and then his twin brother, who did not undergo any of these uh, surgeries, as the control. And so that's why it was a good experiment for him. So Money subjected the siblings to frequent and grotesque counseling and examination sessions he would ask them about their genitalia, their sexual desires at the age of six. He would show them naked pictures of children and adults having sex. And he asked them to strip naked so he could expect their genitalia. He also had them simulate sex acts before the age of eight. And at the age of eight, Money attempted, John Money attempted to convince the family to complete the surgical construction of David or, or Bruce's vagina. And at age 12, he convinced the family to start giving Reamer estrogen. Uh, soon after, the twin brothers became so fearful of money because he would make them do these things during these sessions. He would also scream at them when they would not want to do these things that eventually they refused to go visit him anymore. And eventually the twins stopped seeing money and he fell out of his care or they fell out of his care. And here's a quote from John Money where he said, quote, if I were to see the case of a boy aged 10 or 11 who is intensely erotically attracted toward a man in his 20s or 30s, if the relationship is totally mutual and the bonding is genuinely totally, totally mutual, then I would not call it pathological in any way. Now, this, of course, is 
outright pedophilia or the justification of it. And we'll see this theme or mantra repeated throughout the entire transgender ideology by many other people. So John Money published his findings in his books uh, and in, in, in books and magazine articles about what he was able to do to the Reamer twins. And his theory that boys and girls are gender fluid uh, was given some credibility because of what he was able to do to David. And the media and academic world actually picked up some of his, his you know, quote unquote research and made a little bit of publicity about it. And that's how the ball initially got rolling on the gender movement to begin with. Now, after money stopped the care, David stopped taking hormones and he began living as a boy, you know, named David. However, his genitals were totally disfigured and he never lived a normal life after. His mother remarked, that kid has done nothing but suffer all of his life. And then eventually, after numerous suicide attempts throughout his adult life, and this is also another theme you will see very common, very often in the transgender world, eventually David was successful and took his own life at the age of 38. Here's a, a screenshot of a video of David and his mom, who actually went on the Oprah show in 2000 under a segment titled, Why the Boy Who Was Raised as a Girl Forgave His Mother. And here's a, a closer up shot. As you can see right here, he, he's a, he looks like a great guy, handsome guy. Unfortunately, he went through all of these experiments on him when he was young. And it effectively ruined, a life, ruined his life, probably psychologically scarred him. And unfortunately, he ended up killing himself. Now, what is more unfortunate is that we are now, without exaggeration, repeating the David Reamer experiment. I would say... In experiment in quotes because it is questionable what you're even trying to find out by doing this but we are repeating this horrible experiment on tens of thousands of kids in modern society now let's go into a more modern uh, approach to the gender movement which is the flag you see the flag being used everywhere right it is almost like the the main aspect of the, of the modern day transgender movement. So you see this flag here and the notable colors are light pink, uh, light pink, light blue, and white. You also see this color scheme has been incorporated into this flag, which combines those same colors with the kind of classic pride flag that we all knew growing up. And this flag is right here hanging on the white house. Here it is, the same transgender flag in front of a federal building below the American flag. So this flag is everywhere. I'm sure you've all seen it everywhere you go nowadays because it is put everywhere and you are forced to accept it. So although the initial history of the entire gender movement is uh, was steeped in child abuse and potentially pedophilia, that is still a large part of it today, even with this flag. So it is still full of child abusing, pedophilic, and sexually perverted men. And that is no more evident than in this exact color scheme of the flag. And I'll show you why. So the dark history of the gender movement was uh, the, the flag itself was started and designed and created by a guy named Robert Hoey. Now he changed his name to Monica Helms later in life because he says he, uh, he was a woman. He was actually a Navy veteran who used to steal his mother's clothing as a child to try on. He continued stealing women's clothing as an adult because it aroused him. So he transitioned into a woman as an adult after leaving the Navy. He wrote many books and short stories under his new name, Monica Helms. And so that's why we know about all of his thoughts and what he was thinking when he designed the flag. So he himself admitted, quote, I would spend hours looking at girls at school. I studied them more and more with my study slowly evolving into lust. And this would become a prominent theme in his uh, adult life where he was apparently obsessed with losing his virginity. Another quote from him is, quote, The feelings I had, dressed as a woman, ran the gamut of human emotions. Sexual excitement topped the list of what came over me while wearing women's clothes. So he openly admits that he wasn't necessarily a woman. He just really liked wearing women's clothes because it turned him on. And then here's a, a quote from an article written about him where it says that Helms also authored short stories with sexual themes, including forced feminization, where men are transformed into women as a humiliating punishment. One story in particular sexualizes a child, and Helms, Helms said the concept came to him in a dream. Right, So this idea of 
things coming to people in a dream, almost like a fantasy, is incorporated into his name because Helms took his last name from the Lord of the Rings. And if you remember the movie, there is a battle at Helms Deep in the movie, and Helms Deep is like a, I think it's like a castle or something like that. So that indicates his interest in fantasy. And this interest in creating fantasy and in fantasy in general is very common in the trans community. It almost acts like an avatar for them where they can take their normal kind of boring, oftentimes lonely life, and then outsource it to this more apparently attractive and popular avatar. And that's why in the trans, uh, trans identities are very common in like the anime community, the cosplay community, and you'll see... Many, many people identifying as trans and non-binary at these Comic-Con conventions where they dress up in all sorts of costumes because it's a fantasy escape for them. Now, here's more about Monica Helms or Robert Hodge. This is him early, later in life. You can see he has his Navy hat on. So one of his erotic short stories included a girl who never grows up. Uh, here's another one to, showing that while serving in, with the Navy, U.S. Navy, Helms began stealing women's underwear from the laundry room of his apartment complex in South Carolina. Here's a quote from him where he says, quote, I identify as a female, but I'm more of a bi-gender person. This allows my brain to float between multiple worlds or solidly take on one role or another. Sometimes I am a man and sometimes I'm a woman at the same time. Or I can change back in a nanosecond. Or I can then, then change back just as fast. Obviously, you can tell this is very scientific stuff we're talking about here. Uh, if a child tells you the same thing, you are not allowed to question it because this is proven science. So the color scheme of the flag, light pink, light blue, and white, is the exact same color scheme used by many pedophile societies. Now, here is Helms or Robert Hoge in his own words, quote, the light blue is the traditional color for baby boys and the pink is the traditional color for baby girls. Here is the flag he designed. Here is an image from a minor attracted person's support chat image. Now, what is a minor attracted person? It is a person who is attracted to minors. We used to call them pedophiles, but now these people have rebranded themselves in a more academic term. And you can see that they use the same colors, light pink, light blue, white, same as over here. And according to a researcher, Sarah Good, who is a member of Stop SO, which is an orga organization to prevent sexual offending, pedophiles who organize online have their own culture, language, and symbols. And one of these symbols is uh, incorporates the baby blue, pink, and white. And she says, quote, the pink half represents girl lovers and the blue half represents boy lovers, which is effectively what Robert Hodge himself said, that the blue is for baby boys, pink is for baby girls. And you can see here's a cover of one of the books he wrote where you have the light blue and you have the pink. <clears throat> now, this information is all out there. If you go on Google, there are sub stacks, which are like, uh, you know, journalists, personal websites. And so I use uh, one guy named Graham Linehan and another person named uh, Genevieve Gluck. And they've done extensive studying and research on the origins of transgenderness and specifically on this topic of the flag. Now, these themes of pedophilia, interest in children, and even, like I said, the feminization story where men are transformed into women as a hum humiliating punishment, we'll see how that all actually relates to the WPATH. And the WPATH is the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. It is a medical organization that is effectively the world's authority on transgender medicine. So they make all the recommendations that the world's medical societies, hospital systems, and doctors follow, uh, you know, similarly to the medical organizations we have in the United States. And I will show you that doctors in America openly say they follow these recommendations. So here's Richard, who goes by Rachel Levine, who is the current Assistant Secretary for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and also an admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. Here's a picture. Not the prettiest sight, as you can see. Uh, this is, you know, one of the top medical doctors in all of the land. And he has, on many, many, many occasions, tried to get kids on the puberty blockers, saying kids need puberty blockers, etc., etc. 
So he is also a member of WPATH, or he speaks there very often. And in the most recent standards of care for the health of transgender and gender diverse people, version 8, released by WPATH in 2022, so very recent, there is a section on Unix. So some of you might be familiar with what Unix are, maybe some of you are not. So a very quick de definition is a eunuch is a castrated man placed in charge of a harem or employed as a chamberlain in a palace. And I'll get into these words uh, very shortly. But if you don't believe that there is a chapter on Unix in the standards of care released by this medical organization, these are screenshots that I took after downloading the PDF myself. This PDF is still available on the website. So here you can see standards of care for the health of transgender and gender diverse people, version 8. Many medical doctors are listed in here. Some of them are very prominent in the transgender health field. And this is a screenshot I took, chapter 9 eunuchs and i'll get into more detail right now so a eunuch is a castrated human male from a remote antiquity eunuchs were employed in the middle east and in china for two main functions as guards and servants in harems or other women's quarters and as chamberlains to kings so harems were groups of women like the the king or emperor's concubines his wives and eunuchs were the castrated human males meant to guard them. And they were castrated because the king did not want this other man sleeping with his wives. So they would castrate the male. Right? So most underwent castration as a condition for their employment. Though others, others were castrated as punishment or after they had been sold by poor parents. So already you see multiple things going on here. Castrated as punishment. I talked about Monica Helms or Robert Hodge and the stories he wrote about feminization where men were punished. Right, they were turned into women as punishment, and then here's another another theme: after they have been sold by poor parents, we'll really see this theme re arising over and over again, where parents are pushing this onto their children as a form of social climbing. Does any of this sound remotely medical? No, obviously it's not. These are almost like medieval barbaric practices that are now openly being discussed by medical organizations and then their their recommendations are being taken up by medical doctors and societies in america and across the world so here's more infographics on unix you pay attention to here for coercion you know reasons to become a eunuch coercion about an eighth of those who became eunuchs were young children bowing to parental pressure families would receive a cash reward for donating their sons but they also hoped their children would have a more comfortable and prosperous life Right, so this child thing will come up over and over again. There's a reason why children are being so heavily targeted in this trans movement here. And so you, you're probably saying, there's no way that this medical organization is talking about the same types of eunuchs that I have been talking about in the last slide. Well, here is another screenshot I took, and these highlights are my own, where they explicitly acknowledge they are in fact talking about the same ancient eunuchs. So, quote from the standards of care. While there is a 4,000-year history of eunuchs in society, the greatest wealth of information about contemporary eunuch-identified people is found within the large online peer support community that congregates on sites such as the Eunuch Archive, www.eunuch.org, which was established in 1998. And we'll get into this Eunuch Archive very shortly. So, continuing later on a couple paragraphs down, quote, according to the website, as of January 2022, there have been over 130,000 registered members from various parts of the world, and there are over 23,000 threads and nearly 220,000 posts. For example, two threads giving instructions for self-castration by injection of different toxins directly into the testicles have about 2,500 posts each, and each has been read well over one million times, end quote. That is, they are explicitly saying that they are getting advice from an online forum where random internet users talk about self-castration by, by injection of toxins directly into their testicles. They then use this to give their recommendations, their summary of recommendations on how to uh, approach eunuch individuals they're not just eunuch they're now a an entire class of individuals that can self-identify and they have a series of recommendations shown here about how you should approach eunuch individuals 
So now getting more into that Unic archive website, here is a video between Genevieve Gluck and another woman where they discuss exactly what goes on on these websites and how much child pornography is on these websites. Listen. About the research that I did on the Unic archives, which was related to the WPAC. So, okay, so we established what WPAC is and why they're influential. Um, but in December, they released the updated draft standards of care. Standards of care are the recommendations for medical authorities on how to treat what they call gender dysphoria. Um, in the new draft standards of care, which is the version 8, they introduced for the first time the concept of a eunuch as a gender identity. Um, so I, when I saw that, you know, alarm bells went off, mm -hmm. I, I thought, you know, this, this is insane. How could they be citing this website? Uh, because that website is filled with written pornography and nearly half of it is written pornography about castrating children violently um, in horrible detail. Um, there's stories in there about children going to a doctor with a problem of stunted puberty and then the doctors rape them um, written in really graphic graphic detail the members of the forum write the stories themselves they keep the ongoing archive of them uh, there's currently nearly 10,000 of these stories and of those about 4,000 are about minors or about children so again, this website was cited in the standards of care for WPATH, who creates international guidelines about transitioning children, especially recommending drugs to them that we know are used to chemically castrate sex offenders. Uh, this website eroticizes the castration of children um, and even of doctors sexually abusing children. So yes, you heard correctly. That website has tons of stories similar to Robert Hoge from his stories where children are eroticized and in these stories children are raped. This forum was, without exaggeration, used as part of the guidelines in a WPATH official standards of care transgender medicine recommendation sheet that are now unequivocally used by hospital systems in the United States to provide gender affirming care for minors. If you don't believe me, I'll show you. About the re so here are several videos from Boston Children's Hospital that is, I believe, affiliated with Harvard Medical School where they not only explicitly talk about how they follow WPATH guidelines, but how they also give uh, mastectomies to 15-year-olds, hysterectomies to women under or girls under the age of 18, how they get these kids into the gender-affirming care medical pipeline from the age of 2 or 3 years old, uh, and, and more. Watch. Eligibility for getting gender affirming surgeries at Boston Children's Hospital is basically the same as it would be for most other hospitals or surgeons in the United States. And that's the case because we all follow the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, or WPATH, standards of care. For top surgery, you are requested, but not required, to have been on gender affirming hormones for at least a year. If you're a trans woman, it's really encouraged that you be on estrogen for at least a year because you want to maximize your natural breast growth. Many surgical centers require you to be 18. At Boston Children's Hospital for top surgeries, we'll see people as young as age 15 if they've been affirmed in their gender for a long period of time. So notice how they call a mastectomy top surgery because that makes it sound nicer, especially for kids. It's a lie. You would never call a surgery something by some layman's terms. You would just tell them what the actual name of the surgery is. It, 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 and they say how they only give it if you've been affirmed in your gender for a long time. Well, you'll see in this video right here that, of course, a lot of these kids are affirmed in their gender for a long time because they're put into this medical pipe, uh, pipeline from a very young age. 
Most of the patients that we have in the GEMS clinic actually know their gender, usually around the age of puberty, but a good portion of children do know as early as seemingly from the womb, and they will usually express their gender identity as very young children, some as soon as they can talk. They may say phrases such as, I'm a girl, or I'm a boy, or I'm going to be a woman, or I'm going to be a mom. Kids know very, very early. So in the GEMS clinic, we see a variety of young children all the way down to ages two and three, and usually up to the ages of nine. When they come into the so as you can see, this woman, again, official videos from Boston Children's Hospital, and they took these videos down, obviously, once people found out about them because they're trying to cover up their crimes. She talks about how these kids, apparently from birth, know what gender they really are. As soon as they can talk, they'll tell you. And the, the clinic system will take them at the age of two or three years old. And these are like licensed, you know, psychologists and therapists and all sorts of things working alongside medical doctors. This isn't even pseudoscience. This is tantamount to witchcraft. Like, this is Hansel and Gretel type of stuff where these people, like these witches, are luring children in. And then instead of an oven, they're putting them on an operating table to carve their breasts off. Here's a, a surgeon talking about hysterectomy for minors. Similar to most hysterectomies that occur. A hysterectomy itself is the removal of the uterus, the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus and the fallopian tubes, which are attached to the sides of the uterus. Some gender-affirming hysterectomies will also include the removal of the ovaries, but that's technically a separate procedure called a bilateral oophorectomy. And not every gender-affirming hysterectomy includes that, and people who are getting gender-affirming hysterectomies do not have to have their ovaries removed. Here's another surgeon talking about uh, surgical options and what they've done for minors. Inversion vaginoplasty is the full name of vaginoplasty. In this procedure, the surgical team is creating the outer and the inner vagina. The reason it's called penile inversion vaginoplasty is because we use the penile skin and the scrotal skin in order to. Uh, I just noticed they spelled penile wrong. Reconstruct the vagina. By doing so, we um, break it down to all of its components and we use uh, some of the tissue to reconstruct things the way they were supposed to be for that thing. Remember, all these videos are geared towards children. These are Boston Children's Hospital videos. For getting Penile yeah, so most of the patients yeah, that we sorry. have... Alright, now here's another little funny thing just to lighten the mood, I guess. So I talked to you about Richard Levine, who goes by Rachel Levine, who is an admiral in some public health corps, you know? So a lot of these guys, white men are being blamed for everything in society, like I showed you in that one protest. So these guys, what they're doing is in order to get advancements in the, their careers and in the military, they're just taking their pants off, throwing on a skirt, growing their hair out, and then they call themselves women, and then now they're actual generals and high-up people in the military. These are real pictures. I'm not. These are not fabricated. This guy right here, all he did was he put some earrings on, put some lipstick on, and it's like a little bit of, uh, you know, mascara, grew his hair out, and now he's the head of Space Force, which is like this major military department. This guy right here as well. I don't know what his position is, but I remember seeing videos about him. He is a real military member. Obviously, all he did was grow, grow his hair out, and then now he gets all these pictures taken of him and how he's advancing up the military chain. He looks like the comic book guy from The Simpsons. Exactly like that. This guy is the funniest of all. So this guy, obviously, you know, just looks like a regular dude. Maybe not the most attractive or socially successful. So what he did is he called himself a woman and threw on a wig. And I'm not making this up. He became the official spokesperson for the Ukrainian army. And these are real videos publicly released by him and Ukraine. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Watch and listen. Russia hates the truth. That their obsessive focus on a Ukrainian volunteer is simply allowing the light of the Ukrainian nation's honesty to shine brightly. Next week, the teeth of the Russian devils will gnash ever harder, and their rabid mouths will foam in uncontrollable frenzy as the world will see a favorite Kremlin propagandist pay for their crimes. Russia hates the truth. <laughs> he went back to being a man because nobody believed him, which just shows you. Uh, you know, it's it's science. Once a child says that they're a gender, they stay that way for the rest of their lives. Oh, really? So these adults that are just flopping back and forth apparently disproved their entire 
a theory, but you know, let's ignore that. So let's get into the LGBT organizations because they play a major role in this whole movement as well. So the reason why people are afraid to call things out is because a lot of these LGBT organizations are supporting this trans stuff and this non non-binary stuff. So people think, oh, the entire queer LGBT community is totally united on this and it's all good stuff. So here's one example. Uh, it's called the uh, Mermaids. They're an organization in the UK, very similar to organizations in the US. This is one of the biggest. This is a quote from their own website. This is a picture of their website. You know, they're supporting trans, non-binary, gender questioning children. And today we're one of the UK's leading trans focused charities. So here's a picture of Susie Green. Again, note the hair color change. It is a signal. Susie Green ran mermaids until 2022 when she resigned. Her own son was diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And here's a quote from an article written about her where effectively their son was just an effeminate son, right? He was kind of a girly, girly kid, and the father did not like that. So here it is, quote, However, the boy's father, Tim, did not approve of their young son's behavior. It created tensions within the marriage, and the couple went to counseling. So... The boy was playing with girls' toys, girls' dresses, stuff like that. Father did not like that. So Susie Green tried to find a solution. And then she says that at the age of four, the boy announced to, uh, to her that, quote, God had made a mistake. Never heard a four-year-old talk like that, but apparently this is all true, according to her, and that he was supposed to be a girl. So age seven, he was taken to a clinic for gender called the Tavistock Clinic in the UK. This clinic was recently shut down, and they're now going through tons of lawsuits from all the kids who were butchered in this clinic, and he was diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Now, Stephanie Davis Arai of Transgender Trend, an organization advocating for evidence-based care of gender dysphoric children, says, quote, Susie Green's experience in her own family was upsetting, but not that uncommon. Dad can't accept an effeminate son. Family falls apart. But her solution was an excessive reaction to family troubles, to say the least. So effectively what they're saying is that in a lot of these quote-unquote gender dysphoric children, what it really is, is a child who doesn't really behave the way a typical child for that gender should be behaving. The parents don't like it. So rather than having, let's say, a gay son, what they do is they transition that boy into a girl, so that way that they are a straight girl, right? So if there's a boy who's effeminate, and a lot of these boys who are effeminate grew up to just be simply gay men, rather than having a gay son they will make the son a woman since the woman now likes or still likes boys because they're a gay man but they're not gay anymore because a woman liking a man is straight so they have a straight daughter a straight trans daughter it's gay conversion therapy uh, ther therapy and we'll see quotes about that so Susie green's son had multiple suicide attempts similar to david reamer he was taken to thailand by his mother to have his penis surgically removed at age 16 and that that was done. Now you're already seeing these themes pop up again. Like with the eunuchs, how parents would coerce children into doing this. John Money co coerced uh, the Reamer twins into doing certain things. This is a reoccurring theme. And so here, gay right campaign, or campaigners are also concerned that mermaids, under Green's leadership, was complicit in a form of gay conversion therapy. Dennis Kavanaugh, lawyer and director of the Gay Men's Network, points to a 2012 survey of Tavistock patients, which found that 90% were simply same-sex attracted. They're just gay kids. So this echoes what Tavistock whistleblowers said about the service that Susie, Susie Green's mermaids helped transform, that it was a form of conversion therapy for gay kids. Quote, So many potentially gay children were being sent down the pathway to change gender Two of the clinicians said there was a dark joke among staff that there would be no gay people left. So whenever someone tries to tell you that trans is the new gay movement, they have no idea what they're talking about. Trans is a conversion ther uh, therapy for gay kids. Explicitly, it's what it is. So it was also medically uh, it was also discovered non-medically trained staff were allegedly advising that puberty blockers were completely reversible which evidence suggests otherwise. And we'll see how in America, puberty blockers are, are openly advised as being reversible, not just by non-medically tra trained staff, but by medical doctors as well. So as a result, Mermaids was investigated for its dealings with children. 
Now, here's another thing talking about puberty blockers. So, Susie Green's son was placed on so many hormones that when he was taken to Thailand to be castrated by his own mother, the course of puberty blockers that he had been on for years made his penis so small, right? Because if your puberty is blocked, your testes are not going to develop. So his penis was so small, doctors were unable to construct a neo-vagina with it, which already in and of itself disproves that puberty blockers are reversible. If you stop the main parts of puberty, even if you take the puberty blockers away, you're almost certainly not going to develop normally. Now, more background on mermaids and this theme of grown men enjoying little boys. So Dr. Jacob Breslow, pictured here, is an associate professor of gender and sexuality. Right, He wrote books about the queer life of children's desires and other social justice, top, justice topics. So the same Breslow, who was a trustee for the Mermaids organization, wrote a blog for eight years that called for pedophilia to be reframed as a sexual identity and was a subscriber to a magazine for child abusers such as this pictured here. So, you know, we were talking about eunuch identity, gender identity. They want to make all of these things an identity so that way you cannot call it a crime or you cannot pathologize it and you can't question it. They want to make it into like an almost science rather than what it is, which is a criminal activity. So, uh, Breslow was eventually removed. He had to resign from the organization because he spoke at a symposium for this organization called NAMBLA. So NAMBLA is a North American man-boy love association, effectively an association advocating for men who are in love with boys. And it's explicit in the name of their organization. This is what they're about. So he read from a paper which he rejected the understanding of pedophilic attraction to children as being inherently harmful and supported the concept of pedophilia being classified as a sexual or political orientation. And this gets back to what I was saying is that a lot of these people in the transgender movement with their hair color and their politics and talking about people who wave American flags are racist and bigots and et cetera, stuff like that. It's just a political movement they're jumping onto because they have no idea what they're talking about with regards to their own sexual orientation. So just a quick summary of what we've gone over here and i'll make this probably the end of the first half of the lecture i guess or the powerpoint so pioneers of the field abused and mutilated young boys had them engage in sex acts and destroyed their lives to produce me uh, meaningless results the creator of the trans flag is an adult man who became aroused in women's clothing and used the exact same colors to design his flag that pedophiles used the largest and most respected trans health organization in the world that major medical hospitals and doctors absolutely follow advocates for the creation of eunuchs, a.k.a. castrated males in medieval ancient times, and takes medical advice from violent child pornography forums. Many of the LGBT organizations that support transgenderism are also linked to child pornography sites and magazines and groups, and the purposeful transing of kids is often to avoid a gay child or to prove their loyalty to a social cause. And then the story of David Reamer, Susie Greenman, and her son, the classic tale of eunuchs, what John Money did to young boys, and the inclusion of the eunuch chapter itself in the WPAT standards of care all paint a dark picture of attraction and manipulation of young children and young boys. Right, so this kind of just reiterates what I was talking about. The underlying reason for much of the trans movement is a desire to be seen by society in, in a more socially positive light, and it's not and, and to be not be looked down upon. It is effectively a social climbing system that is often pushed by parents, doctors, and the organizations themselves. However, this social movement based in pedophilia has now been pay, been taken as a factual medical science and medicalized, completely integrated into medicine being taught in medical schools now and biology being taught to young children. And you are not allowed to question this, even if you are a doctor or a biologist. Parents or adults literally experiment with children by starting them on puberty blockers or homo hormones at a very young age. 
They then often proceed to full-blown genital reassignment surgery as adolescents, and these kids often attempt suicide multiple times throughout their lives. So, you as a doctor need to understand that the medical field as a whole has now completely embraced an ideology built upon these aforementioned principles. And make no mistake about it, I know medical students who are being taught this in schools right now. They are being taught that there's no such thing as sex or gender, that you have to give gender-affirming care, that all of these principles that I talked about are absolutely biologically sound. So not only is this being embraced by the medical field, but the medical field has absolutely lost its mind. And as long as you allow this to remain in the field of medicine, whether you like it or not, whether you're involved in the gender-affirming care or not, whether you oppose it, this is what you and your medical degree now represent. Because all of you as doctors are going to be taking care of men and women. But if you can't define what a man or a woman is, then you are part of this system whether you like it or not. Not only that, the public knows the truth, and they do not respect doctors the same way they used to, and understandably so. You also need to understand that the new trans movement is using both the medical field and the old lesbian, gay, bisexual community, including their pride flags, as cover to advance their cause. So they're using the previous scientific legitimacy and respect that the medical field had or has and the kind of uh, LGB community and the fact that nobody wants to be called homophobic as a cover to advance their effectively pedophilic child abusing cause. So this way, anytime someone opposes gender ideology, they can scream two things. That number one, you're anti-science. And that number two, you're anti-LGBT or homophobic and transphobic. And so the focus on children has seeped into medicine. So as you can see, there's a large focus on children in the trans ideology, but now there's a heavy, heavy focus on children in the medical trans ideology. And it's not a coincidence that so many of these hospitals focus on trans kids and so many of these politicians focus on medical care for trans kids, right? This is a pervasive mantra that kids know exactly what is correct with regards to their body even though I've shown you multiple videos where even college students don't even know how a basic human body works anymore. But we're supposed to believe that these children can make lifelong changes to their body based on this ideology that not even adults can describe properly. This goes against all basic common sense. Every parent knows your child will just say things and, and has no idea what they're talking about half the time. And, but you're literally not allowed to question this even as a doctor. And furthermore, this breaks all medical ethical rules as we would never allow a child to consent on their own, nor dictate a diagnosis on their own. So when a child comes to a clinic, they can't just say, I have this diagnosis, and then you as a doctor have to affirm that. That doesn't work for any other disease process, but for this, when it comes to transgender care, everyone simply looks the other way and keeps their mouth shut because everyone's too afraid to say anything. Now, some people will say that, well, parents always give consent, right? And that's justification. That's not true. No, well, number one, these parents are brainwashed, so even though they're giving consent, they have no idea what they're doing as well. But not only that, in a lot of cases nowadays, the state and child protective services are taking children away from their parents when they don't consent to these procedures. And so the, the, these procedures are being done even though the parents do not consent. Here's a most recent example, and this is starting to happen more and more frequently. This is from Montana from January 29, 2024, where a Montana family loses custody of a teenage daughter after expressing opposition to her gender transition. So effectively what happened is this girl who had mental health issues, I think she was depressed and maybe had suicidality, went to a hospital, and at the hospital she said, oh, I actually identify as a male named Leo. So the psychiatric department was involved. They said, yep, gender dysphoria, and if the parents don't want to treat it the way they want to, then that is, in a, a, a sense, neglect, and the state has to get involved. Child pr Protective Services have to get involved, and the child was removed from the home in order to provide them the medical care. This is, uh, this is insanity, and as long as medical doctors stay quiet, more and more families are going to lose custody of their children so that way they can be given medications and treatment that are literally based on an ideology propagated by pedophiles. 